Hello. Hello, Pineapple O. Hello, Gift of Light. Hello, Andrew. Hello, Olive. <laughs> Welcome to Jimno PD. Here we are. Three years ago, we had a conversation in the bottom of the ocean at Jimno PD. Over there on one of these beds, you might know which one it is. I think that bed is gone. <laughs> these are five new beds, deceptively similar to the original bed. And better quality. Right, that's how things have gone uh, <laughs> over the last three years. So three years ago, you were performing Boto for about six months at a time, right? Um, not including the bedroom version, where you act out all the characters by yourself. Right. To be honest, uh, which month? I, I can't remember which month we interviewed in. We'll have to go back and look at it. Yeah, but I've been doing a, a small amount of the immersive show Boto, and then also a small amount of sound baths that I was going to start to do more. It was just things were in their infancy. It was the first month or two that things were actually clean enough that we could do anything here other than sweep and mop. Yes, and we're sitting in this 1970s gymnasium. There is a basketball <laughs> hoop like on both sides. And I remember the days when you were scraping rats. First day was rat corpses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we had this conversation. And at the time, Boto was just starting. And now it has come to an end. Yes, after many years, we brought it all the way to its final resting place. It met its destiny. After four years. Four and a half years. Okay. Yeah. How do you feel now that the show has been a success, has gotten really good reviews? It's in the New York Times. Everyone has seen it, everyone who wants to see it. <laughs> Tickets were really hard to find. And now the last show was performed on Wednesday, last week. Mm -hmm. Five days ago. Yes. Right. How do you feel? I feel wonderful. I feel exhilarated and triumphant. And you might think like, well, of course you do. That's no surprise. But actually, this is, uh, this is the exception feeling. Like the rule is that I would be worn out and be like destroying everything I made right now. Like every album that I've put out, I've broke up the band mm -hmm. in like a, like a sort of downcast and uncomfortable, unpleasant way. I've broken up the band after every album. And uh, you know, even after Houseworld, I was like ragged after that show. And it was just this big slog in front of me of like, ah, oh, now like my bank account is zero. <laughs> I've got to teach like, one year of piano lessons to just like <laughs> to make get, it up. <laughs> get the foundation back. So um, the fact that I feel strong and proud and like still energized and the fact that I, I started working on the next show today, mm -hmm. it's like this is a position of strength that maybe I've never been in before and I'm 40. So this is maybe the strongest I've ever been after a production. I love it. 40s are the best. <laughs> I feel like we live our 20s and then... 30s is like, okay, you get another 10 years. Let's just do the same thing or something different again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and now you know yourself. You have all these experience. And you know what the next masterpiece is going to be. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that 20... Your emotions are running really strong. So it's a great time to make music, I think, because... Um, Music thrives on strong, real, authentic emotions. Um, and maybe something like this, where there's a lot of moving parts and it just takes like a lot of um, like logistics and organization. This is maybe uh, an art form that's better for my 40s when I'm just a little more stable. I can see things a little more clearly. Like depression and even like euphoria isn't like clouding my judgment so much or clouding my ability to make it through a day anymore. When you look back, what are the, the images you see in your head and the feelings overall that, that stand out to you? About bottom of the ocean? Bottom of the ocean, the whole 
Um, Four years of work and a lot of work is behind the scenes, you know, creating, um, casting, right. training everybody, sure. and uh, I mean, we I perform see, as well. Yeah, yeah. I see the people. I see the the family that we created, the mm -hmm. family of our mm -hmm. cast. Um, I see a lot of Chia, I see uh, who is my main collaborator. I see a lot of Laura, our costume designer. And really, one of my, one of the thoughts that has a lot of potency, one of the discoveries, the, the central discoveries of this run was that when the second person came in, when Chia came in, the show stopped being melancholy and it started being fun. And that was a key moment. Like when I was doing it, it was just this somber ritual. And I feel like by the time the show was done, you just like, your upper lip was sticking out, you know? You like, I don't know if you felt pity or it's not, it felt like you'd been through a funeral. And then as soon as Chi was in the mix, all the characters that like had the potential to be fun started being like more lighthearted and playful. And I started being more lighthearted and playful. Just, I don't know, a solitary effort. It can become like this like it can become self-serious. Yes. And as soon as you're with someone, you can like laugh at everything that you're, that even while you're simultaneous, while you're simultaneously serious about something, you can also laugh about it. Or at least I need that second person and I need that group to really get jolly. I think like humor is, is what I live for. Yes. You find sense of humor in everything, in human relationships, in your art, your project. And... I have seen a photo of the of you and the whole cast and crew um, at Gymnopedia. It's so wonderful. Like I noticed some uh, people that I'm friends with now. When we had this um, interview three years ago, it pretty much was like you. It was just me. <laughs> I think Chia was definitely a part of Maybe it. Maybe Chia was just about to become yeah. more uh, active day to day. And and it's such a such a fun journey to like a, have an ensemble. <laughs> Absolutely. And community, yeah. So you don't like to look back that much. I'm trying to think of like what we have talked about and what has um, evolved. We walk around and you um, show me how all these instruments work. And after that interview, I actually performed Sound Bath with you. Yes. Uh, several of them, and mm -hmm. it was super fun. How, what was sound to you before the show or before at the time to now the last version, the, the, the grand version, the final version of the show, how had the element of sound evolve? Mm. Uh, you know, I would say we were pretty close. Like our, our, <laughs> our perception of sound didn't change very much over the years, but uh, we did get a lot better at the sound bath. And that was like, I went through the show once mm -hmm. in, in my, in my life. I saw, I experienced this show probably a hundred times because of all the rehearsals that we did. Like I saw the scene separately so many times, but one time I went through from, you know, during a live show and that was one of the main takeaways was just like, I knew exactly what to tell the cast to get rid of swishing robes and to get rid of footsteps and i realized how much it meant to like uh wave something by someone's right ear or by someone's left ear like and the sound bath got a lot better after i went through so that was that was maybe our evolution of sound but a lot of the stuff like some of the stuff in the soundtrack is stuff we've been playing since house world in 2014 and we just do the exact you same did, thing which song which songs were from Houseworks? No, just like the noise drones that are like the backdrop of music. Like many of them are from 2014 and 2015. And uh, it still works and it still sounds exactly the same and we still like it in the exact same way. So in some ways, like we're a solid rock when it comes to sound. Mm. Tidal Wave Town, I've been singing that song for eight years, so <laughs> a lot. The, we're stable, we've got a stable core of sound. Yes, and now the EP is out. It's on it's Spotify out. and all mm -hmm. platforms, I yeah. suppose. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. And it's sung by different people. Are they all in the cast? Everyone's in the cast. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice showcase of the landscape of voices. 
in, in bottom of the ocean. And from what I <laughs> heard, you added a sexuality scene. That's true. Which wasn't there from the beginning. Tell us about it. Um, I'm, I was very proud and excited about the erotic scene that we added in a, a hall of lamps back there. Um, and we learned something that's kind of obvious, but I'll, I'll explain to you the journey is like when I first got excited about immersive theater, mm. we were like making very like vague and general brainstorms about what our first show could be. And we were just kind of like, and this is going to be uh, the room of sadness and this is going to be the room of laughter and then here this is the erotic room someone's going to be having sex in there mm. and like it's very like not thought through and sure enough like we were able to like find friends to like make all these other half-assed rooms like just go in here and do this just go in here and cry and uh, but when we tried to find a friend to like go in there and do something sexy uh, everyone was too shy uh -huh. and um and people would like commit and then they like get called feet and they like the, the person famously like flaked on the first show we ever did the first house world so we had to grab somebody we had to grab a friend at the last minute and tell them to do something different uh -huh. and well, because uh, it's a one-on-one -on -one moment it, okay. it is in this show and in the in house world there's just going to be a room that you could wander in and out okay. of a big crowd or just one person mm -hmm. but like basically what we learned eyes wide shut style yeah yeah and what we learned is that you have to make the performer feel strong and confident and happy first and give them a well thought through erotic scene and then they're stoked like they're not just like okay I'll do it now but actually the entire cast and people that I perceived as like shy or modest, they were all like, hell yeah, the erotic scene, like bring it on, Andrew. And to finally like find the way to facilitate a sexy performance, it felt to me like an accomplishment. I'm super stoked. Yes. And I, and I performed it. And it was awesome too, because like everyone from like, arguably like the hottest person on our cast to the ugliest person on our cast all everyone across the gender spectrum was performing it for everyone in the audience across the gender spectrum gay and straight and every sexual orientation and it was really cool that like it wasn't even something that was exclusively for hot people or like gay people can only perform it for other gay people it was really just like this very it was open-ended the way that sexuality actually is in real because life. Because we're all humans. Everybody's sexual. Yeah. And the, the scene worked that way. I feel like the time from the beginning of Boto to now, the world has changed so much. It's changed we had a, a pandemic. Yes. And everyone is now, you know, saying what your pronouns are. We have respect for everybody and right. we listen to the stories and you're not necessarily attracted to same or opposite sex just based on how you are and everything. We have a broad spectrum. It's not binary. And um, for, for the world out there, how did these few years, including the pandemic or who the president is, right. <laughs> how did the world um, receive it? Uh, well, I, I can tell you that I personally evolved and Me too. I feel got a lot, became a better person because the world showed that to me. Mm. And um, the way that I was writing and the way that I was assigning things in Houseworld, uh, I look back and it's just like so, uh, in some ways, like just like closed minded and like limited. I, I was limiting myself. And you I'll, felt that. Yeah. And I'll, I'll give you the, an exact example is like, um, we had like one character who's kind of like the wise old man, but also kind of like the wise old- In the bathtub. In the bathtub, mm -hmm. the wise old crackpot. Mm -hmm. So he's sort of wise, he's sort of funny, he's sort of like an idiot. He's giving you, he's telling you some hints about the house. He's also like maybe crazy. And that was a man. And we had our cook too. And the cook was very angry. It's kind of the villain. And that was a man too. And a lot of the people who were cast as, or the, a lot of the women were cast as sort of like these ethereal spirits, mm, you know, like okay. we had the wind, we had the rain. More traditional yeah. archetypes. And, 
and in Boto, the entire cast Anyone played should. every character and uh, every emotion was expressed. And really, like, what made the difference was not the gender. What made the difference is, is this a really extroverted person or is this a really introverted person? Like, what's, how does this person play a ghoul? They're kind of like shy and subdued versus how does this person who's a total ham and they make it their own right and it's and both versions were fascinating and it wasn't like how does a girl play this character how does a boy play this character and so the next time we do house world like girls are going to be allowed to be funny girls are going to be allowed to be angry girls are going to be allowed to be wise or crazy and not just like that ethereal spirit and Mm. and boys are going to or and, and it's not even girls and boys anymore. Everyone across the gender spectrum is going to be allowed to be sexy or beautiful or a dancer or an ethereal spirit, magical. Um, just like anybody can be anything now. I love it. So that is from, from you and the cast uh, point of view. What about the audience? The version that I saw, uh-huh. the hand, we can either touch or hover. Uh-huh. And there are all these like really intimate moments and I'm sure it took some time to adjust to um, you know what people are comfortable with with or without masks right and what do you think that the audience has uh, ha- have they changed right uh, I don't know if the audience has changed in general that much over the eight years that I've done immersive theater mm-hmm. but within those eight years we went on a huge roller coaster of what people were comfortable with um, and, Give us some examples. You know, just based, like the pandemic and masks and whether it's even appropriate to go out, whether it's impro- appropriate to be in an enclosed space with people. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, we had for 15 months, we were dark. Uh, and when we first started doing shows in June and July of 2021, it felt like, I don't know, I felt like somebody might be just about to like, shake their finger at me and be like you naughty you you bad boy like this is inappropriate you're putting everyone at risk like close this show protect our community right and um and then with when we first started there was no vaccine passport right and then when restaurants started in that we followed suit and pretty soon there was delta then there was omicron and when and when we got to omicron it was like you must wear a mask. Uh, like, at first, like, face masks weren't mandatory in household, mm-hmm. or I mean in Boto. And then we got to a mo- our most extreme point, which was January of 2022, where it was you must wear a face mask, you must have your vaccine passport and the booster, even though the city's not requiring it, we're requiring it. And if that caught you by surprise and you don't want to get the booster or you don't want to wear your face mask for two hours, we'll give you a refund. And we announced that, like, days before the first January show. And a lot of people did. Uh And um, we did things like, we're not blowing out the candles with our mouth anymore. We're fanning them out. We're not washing hands on hands anymore. Instead, we have a washcloth, and the washcloth always stays between us and the hand. Mm -hmm. And um, those sorts of precautions, they like peaked during Omicron. And then by this month, we were actually starting to wash people's hands with our oh, hands I again. Oh, I love it. So at the end, like people back were, to the beginning. Yeah, and meanwhile, like there's other people who will like always feel more comfortable wearing a mask or maybe just like they're immunocompromised and they need to wear that mask. Mm-hmm. And now we have some extra tools so that more people can maybe reach their comfort level than before, hopefully. And obviously we have the vaccine, which is an amazing tool. And hopefully like... And, our vaccine technology greatly improved. Yeah, the, the next one I heard from uh, the person who gave me my fifth booster that will be combined so the flu shot and uh, COVID might be one. Right. Time is so funny. Like time is like not real, but it is also, cha- it changes everything. So even though we're, we're at the same spot and having a conversation, you're still sitting on my right. We're a little farther away. Mm. But, um, we're social distancing. <laughs> that's true. But it's everything else changed. Why did you know that Boto is definitely dead? Mm. Why did you say it dies forever? Well, um, I just know that I have 
big plans for other shows, basically for one show, and that's mm -hmm. the, next, the second coming of Houseworld, Houseworld 2, or whatever it's going to yes. be called. And I know that I don't have the bandwidth to keep Boto going. I, I won't be able to bring it back anytime soon. I think that its best parts are going to be folded into Houseworld anyways, its best scenes, its best characters, etc. And, uh, and I don't think any other company is going to like pick it up and do their version of it. And so I think... I've known people who wanted to take it to another country. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, I've heard that too. Or people that mm. want to... Um, like, they're asked... I, someone left a comment today of like, make an LA run of Boto. But um, we're at the point where we've just got to... It's a better decision to just build on our momentum and bring them, you know... Even though House World is not going to be a brand new show, it's going to feel like a brand new show. Mm -hmm. And it, everyone's going to be freshly excited about it. Everybody's going to want to come and see it for the first time again. And um, that's, that's the right move. Rather than just like squeeze every last drop out of Boto and do like a second year until every person who wants to see it has gotten a ticket. We've got to expand. We've got, we, we've got to stop doing the five-person show and do the 35-person show. We've got to sp spread our <laughs> so gospel constantly more. Expanding, uh, we've got to accelerate. Changing yeah. and, forms. And, and to accelerate and to give more people access, even to like bring those ticket prices down, we've got to pause and you know, open up our arms bigger. Yes. For, for the audience who doesn't know, Andrew is ENTJ, mm -hmm. extroverted, intuitive thinking judging right. and yes. i don't even know what each of the, i haven't internalized what each of those four letters mean yes yeah, so but can olive help. is an expert on how i, I am just just we're walking down the streets like john and i will be start uh, we will start typing people we just know oh we walk by a coffee shop that's an intp making coffee right there mm. like we can just feel it yeah i'm i'm enfp kind of like a textbook version i'm excited so my extroverted intuition wanted to talk to you three years ago. I wanted to sit down with you today <laughs> to wrap I'm this happy, up because this so is fun. exciting. Yeah. Yeah. What else do you want to tell us that we don't know yet uh, about you, about the show, about Jim PD? Mm, one thing that maybe, um, you know, since we're both artists, maybe you'll find interest in this is that I'm about to plunge into my least, what's historically my least favorite part of the creative process. Ooh, what is it? And in some ways I'm even trying to not acknowledge this out loud because I feel like if you say that it is, it like makes it so. Sure, sure. But in another way, I feel like I gotta talk through what's, what's true to me. And so the, my least favorite part of the creative process is when the work is on my laptop and it's so far from bearing fruit. Mm. And, um, because with this work that's so material, like it's a 360 world around you that you can touch and smell and everything, and it takes so long to build, that for me to write a scene, and let's say that I write a scene that's like a C plus, like maybe I could improve it to an A, but right now it's just a C plus scene. Um, then I just kind of feel like the scene's so far from happening it's like not even that good. So I don't even know if I want to work hard enough to like make it good and then make it happen. And it's just very easy for me to like want to like end the day discouraged because I feel so far from the fruit. So this is rewriting house world scenes. Yes. And it's going to be such a different house world that like a lot of the scenes will be brand new. Brand new scenes, brand new characters. To me, that almost is the most exciting. That's your favorite? For your friends and, you know, collaborators or people in the community. Um, to, to see what, what is going to come out from Andrew's head. Because, right. like, last time when we had the conversation, I was telling you, I have, like, 500 ideas. But which one's going to stay in my head? Which one's, you know, going to be out in the world? And I think I, I have been very inspired by how a doer you are mm. and you are not alone that we are we're all there to to watch and um to help experience and and we'll tell you the truth <laughs> right i mean <laughs> you make community. a good point olive is that is if it, i what think is it? what is it what right is it? it's coming out <laughs> if i think about my favorite artists from afar 
I'm of course super excited for them to generate new work. Mm. But me, like my personal excitement, it comes when I start to see the idea working. Right. Like, like maybe the second or third time that I perform the erotic scene yeah. and I see that the audience is enjoying it, but I'm still like, oh my gosh, like I can barely remember these lines. <laughs> oh, I'm getting them all right this time. Like that's, that's the apex for me is like early execution the first like successful trials mm. yeah when no one is there with you and you're performing for someone um, for you and for the performers what is that that feeling of no one's gonna judge me if I don't have my lines but I am when um, it's just us making the, the scene work yeah yeah mm. can, you, can, you, can you share a little bit of that right I mean I think I think everyone has an incentive to impress the person that's in front of them, <laughs> right? Because like you're being sized up, right? Uh, and this person, you know, as an audience member, it's like, am I moved by this? I am was I... so scared of you when you did this scene. You performed this for me, <laughs> and it was just awesome. Like this is just Andrew and Olive, but I feel the the, the person. Right. It's like he's a little bit the serious. The taskmaster. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right. But I, I just think that even if no one outside of you and the audience member knows if you fucked up, like you still just having one set of eyes on you is enough to make mm. you want that prize of, of doing a job well done. We're excited for what's going to come out. I'm excited too. Yeah. You yeah. started working on it today? Started working first day, just yeah, on the plane. <laughs> first, first hour of work. I like like planning things or writing things uh, down on a plane because you're slightly, you're like nowhere. You're but nowhere. so you're kind of just like uh, a little trippy, a little sleep deprived sometimes, like jet lagged or, or not. <laughs> it's also cool because it's cramped. And yeah. so it makes you feel like you really want it. Because you're like, I'm doing this even though it's like giving me carpal tunnel. <laughs> This is the end. The end. <laughs> Thank you for chatting. And, Thank you for chatting. Uh, okay, it's, it's good to do this and not do this. I'm glad we did it. Me too. It's not complete. <laughs> Looking forward for to Houseworld 2 and all the fun things that's going to happen in Jimmy PD. Me too. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> She didn't wash your hand back here. No, it was in the hallway. Exactly. So now we take you back here to wash your hands. So like this section, uh, you dress up here. Like Laura dresses you up here, but like this is dark. Though. As soon as you start doing this, suddenly it gets much prettier. All those drips of wax. Over a year. Someone must have done like an immersive 
actual aftermath kind of sculptural <laughs> exhibition. Like I can see this, you know, in the middle. Of this would be in the, in the MoMA, are you saying? Yes. Uh, eventually, you're in here, you're confessing, uh, confessing your pain. Up to this day, the thing I told Chia, I never told anyone the confession. Oh, wow. Yeah. What's said about those stays in the <laughs> This was what we learned during the pandemic. <laughs> this don't blow out your candles, but fan them up. This, that's less, <laughs> less droplets. And it also turns it into a little bit of a fun game. Olive, when I was talking about my favorite creative moments, like um, seeing this materialize, being like, oh my god, this is going to be yeah, yeah. much better. Like that first day of like seeing the set come together, that's when I get my, my, my jollies. It was one of the performers. They, uh, they didn't make it through the run. Well, that suffice. I smile to the camera. <laughs>